Hello, everyone. We are back and we are having our panel discussion as the next uh, featured event at uh, the South Dakota Local Foods Conference. And I am Kathleen, the Local Food System Coordinator with the South Dakota Specialty Producers Association. And we wanted to bring to you tonight, uh, along with our partnering organizations and our sponsors, uh, some innovators in local foods and local food systems that are uh, from our state, from South Dakota. And so these are people who are doing amazing things in local foods, new things, different things, or doing things a little bit differently. And we um, are very proud to feature them tonight. And they're all from different industries and areas. Um, but they're all passionate about local foods and they're all doing um, something uh, very helpful and unique and innovative for our food system here in South Dakota. So without further ado, I can introduce you to uh, each of our panelists just briefly and then um, we'll get started and spend a little time with each one. So first up is Rose Frazier, and she is with the Medicine Root Garden Project. She is executive director there, and uh, she has a very neat program that we're going to hear a lot more about in just a minute. Uh, but we also want to welcome Barbara Cromwell, who is the manager of the Black Hills Farmers Market, and also Chef Nicholas Skyeski. And he is uh, with Skyeski Catering and uh, is doing some innovative things. He comes from uh, the Avera Hospital and, and the hospital industry supporting um, local foods and uh, buying local foods. Um, but we wanted to start with Rose here and um, show you just a short, short video that I found on the Ayata Techa project that um, has the Medicine Root Garden project and um, this video uh, can kind of go over a little bit more of that. Oyata Techa Project means Young People's Project in Lakota. We service over 700 kids in Medicine Root District on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. We provide educational services, recreational services, and we do a lot of prevent kids. One of our programs that we're really proud of is our Medicine Root Garden Project. We select 12 families to work with and they can have the entire family come in and do the garden project. We teach them how to set up their garden, do their irrigation, and then we teach them anything from soil preparation to planting to harvesting and preservation. It's one of the first steps to food sovereignty. It's an opportunity for a food system within our community for eating healthy, eating right, buying fresh locally grown produce and to have seasonal income. I really want to see that grow. I really want to see people get involved in providing healthy foods for their families. Kids these days have a better sense of wanting to be healthier and be educated and know that they're able to grow their own food. We have that connection with these kids. When you teach a younger kid or you teach them at a younger age, it'll stick with them. The kids themselves are the ones that are teaching their families. To see the kids' reaction when they've actually planted a potato to harvesting it is something that is just, it's exciting. They're just in awe. It's really rewarding to see the expression on these kids' face, just to see where a tomato comes from or having them pick corn because they didn't know they have to tear it off of the stalk. These things are new to these kids. 
So having them have that opportunity to harvest their own vegetables is priceless. Our children are sacred. For more information, visit us at oyatetechaproject.org or you can like us on Facebook. So that was uh, from the YouTube video and also is on the website of the Oyatetecha Project website. And uh, Rose is the director of the Medicine Root Garden Project. And she is an enrolled member of the Oglala Lakota tribe and lives in Kyle, South Dakota on the Pine Ridge in Indian Reservation. And she studied at Oglala Lakota College and is a directing, executive director of this project. And I just wanted to ask you first, Rose, uh, how your year with the project went, and if you could just tell us um, uh, what you experienced this year and um, what was different or what was new. Um, the innovation here is obviously food sovereignty. And so we would love to learn more about that from you and, and the steps you're taking with the Medicine Root Garden Project to, um, to meet that goal. So I'll turn it over to you, Rose. Okay, thank you, Kathleen. Um, first of all, that video is a little bit old. Uh, we have since opened up our gardening program. Uh, for the past two years, we have um, 63 people enrolled in our gardening class every, and it's a nine month gardening class. So uh, we start in January and then we go for 16 weeks. We offer the indoor classes and stuff. And then we um, do uh, seven outdoor classes where we do hands-on demonstration. And then the families get to choose what type of method they wanna use. So it's a really in-depth gardening class that um, happens. We do garden plans for the families. We want to know what they wanna do with their food if they're growing solely to uh, feed their families or if they're growing to have a seasonal income or if they're going to um, help their organization grow. So in the beginning, when we first start in uh, February, the first thing that we work on are our garden plans. So the families figure out what they wanna do. We uh, teach them different methods of gardening, what worked for us. And then we go from there, we help them. We have uh, a greenhouse here, which um, all the gardens and gardeners and participants can utilize. So seedlings are planted in March, April, even though it's really cold, they get to um, utilize that, that greenhouse. We also have um, a hoop house where we show them how to grow indoors. I mean, on the, in the hoop house. So um, that early planting, it's an extended gardening section of the, the garden program. And then we also do the uh, farmer's market where in, in June, May, June, July, we try to have them set up their farmer's market for the ones that want to sell. We don't force anybody to sell their produce. It's only if, that, if they want to. And then we collaborate with different organizations that provide um, financial literacy, um, credit when credit is due, and business planning for the ones that want to go into selling their own products. So those classes are offered. We also bring in like Barbara and there's another lady named Maxine. They have farmer's market, one's in Rapid City and one's over in Martin. And we try to collaborate with them and so that we can bring our farmers, our gardeners can take their produce to their farmer's market. So we brought Barbara down to our center and, and she did a really good job of um, giving us an overview of the application process and stuff like that. Um, and then we move on to cooking classes and we move on to food preservation. 
So the food preservation part of it is where we do, we teach basic canning, water bath canning classes, um, pressure canning, dehydration, and freeze drying. So we show the uh, presenters and we show the gardeners how to do all that stuff. And then in October, we do a final, like um, a come together with everybody. Everybody comes together and brings uh, a product from their, their gardens. So it's a really a full circle kind of um, class that we have going on. This year we were able to, uh, we with the 63 people that we had in our gardening program, we were able to have 40 gardens. There's 40 gardens that produced. And so what we do is we try to track and measure all of our produce that comes in and out. So with the numbers that we got from some of our participants, um, this year we grew over 36,000 pounds of produce which is equivalent to um, 18 tons. Um, I'm not sure if, I, I think I went on, am I on? <laughs> so. Yes, on. That is amazing. I was just shocked that you produce that much and you start that early in April. We, um, we start the gardening class in January. And so in January, we have it, we open it up. Uh, we used to only do 12 people, but there was a, a really big interest for it. So what we did was we opened it up. And then, so three years ago when we opened it up, we got 44 students, 44 participants that wanted to participate in our gardening program. And then the following year, it moved up to 63 participants, but we were also, we also had a day class where um, Lid Wound Face Program brought their students over to um, the center where we would have a daytime class for them. And I think they had like nine students in that one. So it just kind of really exploded. And um, this year with the whole pandemic and everything, we have had a lot of people reach out to us, especially when it first started in April and May, which we were already two, three months into our program. And so what we did was um, I had past participants um, two ladies that were in our class the previous year who asked if we could help them set up basic gardening classes uh, via Zoom. So with that, we were able to reach a, an additional 20, 22 students over in Pine Ridge and then 15 students over in um, Wombly. So since we opened it up, um, we have people coming as far as Slim Buttes, which is 87 miles west of us. And then we have people coming from um, the... 63 miles east of us, which is just on the other side of Wombly. And we have this class that's held once a week. And it's kind of like a college class. It's held once a week. And because we know that a lot of our participants come straight from work, we provide them with a, a meal at five to six. And then from six to eight, we have our regular classes. So uh, we had a lot of people, a lot of um, a big interest for it and stuff. And so Right now we're still recruiting. Um, people are asking us if we're, when, when we're starting. So they're keeping tabs on when we're actually gonna be starting the whole program again. Uh, we're still doing a lot of our gardening classes via Zoom with the, this year's class. So we're still participating, the, they're still participating in it. And so what we're working on now is um, seed saving. So it kind of goes into different levels of um, skill. So anyway, but that's what we do. And so it really, gained a lot of popularity this year. Yes, yeah. And it was full circle with the farmer's market then and taking things to market and preserving things, packaging and that too. So it's nice that your uh, Zoom classes are still going too, that that's, you know, just a way to reach so many more people. So I just wondered, my last question would be, what are you um, planning for next year? How, how much can you expand or, or are you planning to expand? Um, I think right now with the size of our building, we can, that's the maximum we can take is like 65 participants. Um, so we are gonna take that, but I think there's opportunity for us to share on Zoom. You know, I think we're gonna still go that route. So we don't know how, how that's gonna progress that way. Mm -hmm. And then, um, oh, I wanted to mention one more thing, but we have two hoop houses and within those two hoop houses, last year we grew over 9,000 pounds of tomatoes 
and we grew those vertically. And this year with our hoop house and stuff, we were it was um, 6,000 pounds of tomatoes. And um, October 23rd, when we got our first snow was the last day of our tomatoes. So we just, re we had tomatoes still growing in that hoop house up until a couple weeks ago. But uh, we're gonna try, we'll open it up. We'll open up the classes and stuff and people will be able to sign up for them. Um, it probably wouldn't, it's really, we, so in January or in March when, when the Zoom, when we all had to transfer over to Zoom, we did lose some participants because they didn't have um, internet connection or they didn't have computers. It was hard for them to follow on their smartphones. So we did lose uh, 14 participants that way. But um, we were able to finish out with the rest of the students and stuff. So it was, it's, it's a really good program. I'm really proud of it. Uh, we are partnering, we got, we received several grants. One of our grants is gonna allow us to purchase um, some coolers, some produce coolers. And I have uh, visited with our, some of our local convenience store owners where we're gonna be able to put our produce in their stores. So that's you know something that we're gonna start with next year. And then another part of our program where we're gonna be expanding is we bought a, uh, we're purchasing a mobile farmer's market truck, a refrigerated truck. So we'll be able to take our produce out even further. Um, that was one of the reasons why we couldn't um, take our produce a long distance was because we would have a refrigerated truck. So with us moving forward this year, we'll be able to have a lot of our produce in three different areas of the reservation and then plus take our mobile food truck, our farmer's market to different areas that don't have um, convenience stores and we do take um, EBT SNAP benefits. Um, one of the other things that we're trying to um, get connected with is the South Dakota Senior Farmers Market. So those are the directions that, that's the direction that we're moving in this year. Okay, great. Yeah, that was um, the question that I had come across on the Q&A was, um, and I think you had answered this before, are you teaching preservation methods? And you said you were teaching a couple of different kinds of canning and, and things. Yeah. So that would be yes. And, and obviously that's really important too, besides getting that refrigeration, but just getting the, the preservation for that much produce to handle. Yeah, great. So we have, um, with our classes and stuff that um, in order, we we wrote a couple of really good grants so that when mm -hmm. when you're enrolled in our program and you finish a section, we give you incentives for completing that section. And then we also have um, farm equipment and drip irrigation and fencing. So when you finish everything in, in May and you're done with your classroom classroom work or classroom everything, we, um, the average garden that we would till up for you is like a 40 by 60, but we also provide with drip irrigation, we provide the fencing and we uh, give you an, uh, gardening tools, your basic rake, shovel and things like that. And then when you take um, a certain amount of canning classes, we provide you with your water bath canner and your, uh, a couple of cases of jars and uh, the water bath, a dehydrator. So you have to go through those classes in order to get those incentives mm -hmm. to, you know, for that. And then we also, when you go through the cooking classes, we provide you with an incentive of, you know, like knives and cutting boards and a couple of mixing bowl, um, bowls and stuff like that. So it's an incentive program. And the reason why we provide those incentives is because we want you to be successful and we want you to continue doing what, you know, we don't want you to have an excuse not to continue. So yeah. that's one of the really successful parts of it. And then for our for our ones that are doing the farmer's market, their incentives is the canopy and a table. So it's a really good program. I mean, if, you, if you're interested in growing a garden and you want to do it for a farmer's market, then we will help you whatever way we, we can. We also bring in Rhoda Bowers from um, SDSU Extension and she does the gap training. Uh, we also try to do the food handlers training, mm -hmm. all of these different trainings in order to help, help you become um, a successful producer. Great, that's wonderful. And um, 
I have just one more question here. We're gonna have to wrap up here. I could talk <laughs> for so long. I could talk to you and ask you questions, but uh, we just have one more quick question here, which is really great too, which that is, do you have any plans to um, start teaching about raising livestock? <laughs> We have a, um, okay, so when I, the reason why we became involved in this is because I took the BFR program before the beginner farmer rancher program. And I did it because I had horses and I needed to take care of them, but we kind of switched gears. We don't have the space to do anything with um, animals, that kind of stuff. So I don't, and we tried chickens before. Um, we had them here and we were doing um, activities with the kids and stuff, but they were here at the center and we were home on weekends. And so it's hard for us to come in and feed them and take care of them and dogs would get to them. So we, we had to not do that. So it's hard for us to do anything like that. We are going to be getting a bigger building here. Um, or hopefully the completion of the building would be 2021 in the, the fall. I mean the winter. So in that building, we have um, put in a, teaching kitchen and then a public cannery. So all of the gardeners that are participating in our gardener class would be able to utilize the industrial size um, dehydrator, freeze dryer, and then the pressure cookers. So that would be something where it'd be like a public cannery for everybody that's in our garden class. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, wonderful. And people can find out more on your website and um yeah reach you on facebook i found you on facebook too and uh i just wanted to say i got a thank you in the chat here as well thank you so much for being here tonight i appreciate thank it you. a lot thank you Great. Well, we um, will go on to our next panelist. We're going to uh, talk with uh, Chef Nicholas Skyeski. And uh, Chef Nicholas has been involved in, in the culinary industry here in South Dakota for eight years and is currently a national account executive for US Foods and owner of Skyeski Catering in Sioux Falls. So he's here to discuss more of that um, distribution and support end here of small businesses supporting um, the local food system. And again, closing that loop, there has to be a demand for um, the, the, uh, the food that is produced and kind of close that loop and, and create that circle. Uh, and I know that Nicholas has a passion for culinary ingenuity and for innovation within the food industry. And uh, with his catering, he supports um, local foods by buying local foods and using them whenever possible. And I think that's a, um, really important part two of all of this that um the general public needs to yeah. get used to food and seeing real food and local food and food that's grown around here and um get used to the fact that um you can cook with it <laughs> and uh and take out that intimidation factor and uh introduce the flavor factor two people. So I wondered uh, from you, Nicholas, what your, um, how that looks when you purchase local foods, if you use a local distributor, or um, how you get that in at your sourcing. And then um, if you've noticed or had any changes with that this year, or if you know, if you've seen more sure. of this. Yeah, great question, Kathleen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, nice to see everybody. Uh, with with Skyeski Catering, you know, we we do we pride ourselves in being an artisan catered experience. And you know, when I say artisan, I truly am referencing of the highest quality ingredients or skill sets, right? 
Um, and so to your, to your question, Kathleen, when it comes to sourcing and look at that glare. Wow. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, when it comes to sourcing, you know, we, we utilize a food hub out of Sioux Falls called Dakota Fresh. Uh, Dakota Fresh Food Hub is, is such a huge asset to our organization because they allow us to source products from every local farmer, producer, grower uh, that is interested in being a part of the hub. And you know what that is? That's convenience. And so uh, as I think about going to the farmer's market on a Saturday morning um, and, and really fighting over the correct pro produce items uh, with, with the general public, um, I don't have to do that anymore, right? I can I can submit an order online to the food hub and, and they can organize my order between all the producers and provide us with uh, some of the highest quality ingredients. And that's, that's what's important to us because when we cater events, uh, in clients' homes or in their businesses, or we're doing a cooking class or or a wedding or whatever that may be, we are looking for differentiation. And we really don't want to provide something that feels mediocre, something that feels average. I don't want to bring products into someone's home where they can recognize that that is $1.99 at their local grocery store, right? And so perception is, is important. And, and when I can trust that the product that I'm providing is of the best quality because it's local, right? It's picked at its peak uh, freshness. It's not ripened with 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 synthetic gases. Um, and the accountability is there. I can trace the product back and I can reference the farmer's name and, and how they produce to the client. All of those levels of details really help us stand out as a catering company. You know, I also would like to point out when you ask about sourcing, Kathleen, that I think it's societally thought upon that you get local food from specialty locations whether it's a farmer's market or maybe a grocer that's, that really specifies that they purchase local. And, and I'm, I'm happy to, to say and that that's not always the case anymore, right? Um, I, I love that our big box grocery stores here in Sioux Falls uh, are supporting local. You can go through the produce section and you can see little signs that reference the farmer that it comes from that's 30 miles north, right? You can reference a partnership where they call out with pictures of the farm and the farmer's family, um, identifying that all of the all of the potatoes, all of the tomatoes in this section of the store come from uh, this farm, and I think that's beautiful too. Because what's so important uh, is convenience, right? You can give people ten different ways to get local food shipped to them, but um, that grocery store stop on the way home from work is is really what they're thinking about. And so to put something like that in front of them there is is crucial. Mm -hmm. um, Kathleen, the second part of your question, you asked if I've noticed anything different. Uh, in the last year. And, and I don't think I have, you know, o over my, my career, I've noticed a continual increase in, in local foods interest. Um, I'd like to say we play a part in that, but I don't know how, how, how much we do. Uh, so COVID or, or any of the pandemic related topics or, or really anything, I, I don't think it's made much of a difference uh, in a negative way. In fact, I think it's more positive. People are at home more, they're cooking more, they're engaging with their kitchens and and really testing themselves to see how they can how they can cook. And um, I'd be interested to see what sales looked like, uh, you know, a year ago, pandemic, uh, or a year before the pandemic at grocery stores and online retailers and local food hubs that, and what they did now, so. Yeah, and we're gonna hear about that from Barbara really soon. Wonderful. But um, I think, it, you know, you mentioned you're not sure what, part you've played in that and I think the big part you know that places um like your business uh plays is that you create that demand to mm -hmm. be able to walk into the big box place and see it because they know oh you know people are buying this and they're buying it in some volume um, mm -hmm. But when you mention Dakota Food Hub uh, that's another just completely innovative um, entity that is uh, doing some really great things where people can just log on and order in some quantity mm -hmm. local foods yeah. and um, that it is delivered consistently and a consistent quality. And apparently I, I think like the um, producers don't have as much to do with like packaging and and all of that kind of you know little stuff that is absolutely um, you know maybe not as uh that is time consuming for producers and um that you don't necessarily need as a larger 
place where you're buying. Right, right. And so I think it's really important to get these volume buys. And I know you were doing it with the Vera at the industrial yeah. level as well. Yeah, so I'd love to touch on that as well, if I may. Um, and to what you just said, you know, when, when we do cook uh, in reference to Sky Ski catering with, with clients, the question, hey, where did you get that? Right, is, is often asked. And, and from a chef's perspective, and when I'm when I'm trying to promote, and this is this is quite ironic because I wear two hats, right? I work for a national distribution company as well um, that also supports local. But I, I do not want the answer to be, oh, you can't get this. It's from a national distributor, right? I want them. I want to be able to say you can get it from a farmer that's local. You can go to your local grocery store, or food co-op, or farmers market and find this product. Uh, but Kathleen, when you reference the hospital, for all of you that are on the call. Previous to working with U.S. Foods, um, I was the regional executive chef for Avera McKinnon here in Sioux Falls, overseeing food service for uh, all McKinnon branded locations here. And the purchasing power that we had was, was so relevant to being able to support local foods. Uh, previously to Avera working at many local restaurants, I also was purchasing local foods, but you know, those are those are independent restaurants where you're serving a few hundred people maybe at most. And we're not talking about thousands per day, like in healthcare. Um, and so to be able to partner with Dakota Fresh, partner with local purveyors and exclusively say, all of our mushrooms are coming from Dan Rizloff's uh, mushroom farm. All of our tomatoes are coming from this producer, so on and so forth. Um, not only felt good for us to provide that, but it felt really good knowing we were supporting the community. We were playing a part in creating trust funds. We were paying, playing a part in creating FTEs for these farmers that never needed an employee. But now that our demand was 600 pounds a week of something, they needed some help, right? And so that felt really good. Um, and that's part of the reason, Kathleen, why I accepted this position with US Foods is, is that I'm able to reach a, a much larger audience, right? I manage all of South Dakota, Southwest Minnesota, Northwest Iowa now versus one healthcare system. And so when I get to interact with clients and customers across this tri-state area, um, we, we support local foods through U.S. foods as well, right? And so if there's distribution centers that are close to local farms, those contracts are created and those, those local products that are sold through our distribution centers are, are you know, notified saying this is a local tomato, this one is not. Make your choice of what you'd like to purchase. Great. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. So you see those those changes mm -hmm. happening and you see that support coming through. What do you see in the future um, for you mentioned a little bit about expansion and um, growth and that um, it seems to be remaining consistent. And I guess I was wondering then if you have any advice for people who might be tuning in um, and on our panel here tonight that uh, for producers who mm -hmm. are um, wanting to dis either distribute their own or go through distributors, um, what mm -hmm. sort of things do you want to see or would make it easier for you to support local foods as a small business person or at the industrial level? Absolutely. Sure. Well, I will tell you, you know, when, when I'm thinking about what would make a general chef or just a, a general uh, residential person want to purchase local food more, you know, I do go back to convenience. Uh, as being the number one thing, because I think so often price really isn't um, much of a factor because we're not talking about, you know, whether the carrots are, are you know, $3 or $20. It's such an uh, incremental difference, really. Um, you know, so when I talk about convenience, I think that when Dakota Fresh dropped their residential delivery program as an option, that was huge. Um, and I think that, that that kind of is the solution, especially in today's day and age, right? So how can you hop online, order what you want and pick it up? Um, I think that's, that's huge, you know, from a producer's perspective, uh, figuring out ways so that your products are more convenient for the customer. And what I mean by that is when, when I have healthcare accounts or large accounts that are purchasing, um, well, anything as an example, but we'll say purchasing 400 pounds of carrots. It matters to them whether the carrot 
has to be washed, has to be the green top has to be taken off, whether it has to be peeled or whether it's ready to use. Now, those are all steps that require labor. Those are all steps that could increase the cost uh, of not only producing, but the cost of selling the product as well. Right. And that was a big barrier for us, Kathleen, because when I was trying to engage with my teams of chefs at, at, at the hospital and talk about, well, maybe today we should do roasted turnips as, as a vegetable option. It wasn't that they didn't want to serve roasted turnips. It, it wasn't that they didn't want to use local potatoes for the mashed potatoes. It was the thought of, well, that's a lot of peeling, right? That's a lot of labor that we'll have to do to get that done. And so I don't know if that's a real solution. I don't know if, if, uh, if, if small producers can, can take these fresh produce items and say, hey, this potato is here and it's X amount per pound. And if you choose that you'd like us to get it so it's peeled, now it's this price per pound. I would be willing to bet that they could have a markup there that made sense for them. And uh, a lot of large accounts would take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Great. That, that is a good um, piece of advice and observation. And I, I think that segues really well into Barbara and... I just want to thank you so much for being here, Nicholas, and for sitting down Absolutely. with us tonight. So I um, hope that we'll see you a lot more on the local food scene as well. Absolutely. You let me know. Thank you. All right. Thanks. <laughs> now, I would like to introduce Barbara Cromwell. We're going to uh, check in with you, the manager of the Black Hills Farmers Market for the past three years. And she is passionate about building strong local food systems. And the Black Hills Farmers Market has increased access to local food and has a year round market in Rapid City. And that's great. And uh, you have your online uh, market now and a branch market near Hill City and uh, have had progress recently with the Double Up Food Bucks program for EBT, an incentive program to buy healthier food or, or fresh food. And then uh, that new wholesale market and uh, the online ordering with curbside pickup, which was, I'm guessing, an innovation this past year. So I just want to know how your year went and, and how uh, much you changed and if you saw like a lot of growth in the market or um, how you adapted to the different way that you were going to have to deal with customers at that level too. So love to hear Barbara. Thanks, Kathleen. And thanks everybody for, for, you know, your time. Um, we, we had a year of, um, you know, just a lot of flexibility and resiliency. Um, you know, a lot of kind of rolling with the changes. Um, and, and I kind of wanted to focus mostly on, um, the creation and, and use of our online market as maybe something that, that is, um, you know, maybe the, the, the newest um, thing that, that people might have the most questions about. When the pandemic hit, you know, we talked about our farmer's market is so much about relationships um, between the producers and the customers and, and how were we going to support that in a way that was safe during the pandemic. Um, and and um, Sioux Falls farmer's market was helpful. They were a little bit ahead of us in putting their farmer's market online. I, I called and asked them a lot of questions. Um, and, and so that's ultimately what we did is, um, you know, create an online market. And um, I'd like to um, share my screen because um, that will help me keep track of where I... OK. 
Can you all see that? Yep. Oh, yes. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, so here is, you know, a, a screenshot of a page of our online store from today. Um, and so it shows, you know, a lot of the produce that's available this time of year. And um, it's, it's worked really quite well for us. Um, it has, you know, created a real time, you know, um, product list. So anybody, you know, wondering, is it sweet corn season yet? Uh, those kinds of things can, can jump on our website and, and see, you know, what kinds of products we have available for that week. There's a, a, a difference between, um, we have some vendors who choose to be on site only, and we have other producers who choose to be um, both online. And then we have other uh, producers who choose to be online only. Um, and so in that regard, it has really allowed us to be adaptable to the broadest um, range of our producers needs. We have quite a few producers this year who, um, who, you know, due to the pandemic largely are choosing, you know, not to be present at our on-site market. Well, with our online um, platform, they're still able to, um, you know, continue with their business at our market. And so that's really a nice thing. The customers have liked this online platform. Um, we have a lot of customers who just check it out see what's there, and then they come and shop at the market as they traditionally would. Um, but we have a lot of customers who really appreciate that they can just drive up in the parking lot and, um, you know, the payment is already handled um, and, and we can just hand them all of their products from 10 different producers if they want um, and away they go without any contact. Um, during the pandemic. And then the other nice thing that's been really nice about this is that convenience factor. You know, Tuesday through Thursday, if you want to pick out your order at two o'clock in the morning in your pajamas or, or what have you, you can shop from, you know, many um, producers at once and, and pay for it at once um, and, and have that all ready to go. So that's really been, um, been a nice option for people. Um, and then the other advantage that it gave us, um, before we went online, we were already in the planning stages of having a wholesale branch for our farmer's market. Well, this became the natural platform then. Um, so we have, uh, you know, you, you sign up as a customer either you know, as a retail customer, we handle our EBT and double up food bucks right through this platform. Um, or you can sign up as, a, as a, a restaurant or institution, that kind of thing. And, and those customers will see a different menu um, that has larger volumes, has more limited products um, and has the wholesale prices. Um, we launched that this year in a limited fashion with Feeding South Dakota um, and learned a lot from that process. And we have a, a grant where we will be bringing on a staff person to really um, put everything that's, that's needed in place over the course of this winter um, for a thriving wholesale market for, for next season. So that's exciting. Um, Here's another, um, you know, screenshot of our store. This one has more of, of the baked goods from the various uh, producers. And of course, you know, anytime you're looking at this, you know, there's, there's prices involved. We went with local food marketplace, um, which has worked really well for us. They have a good customer service to, um, to, you know, really train me and get me up to speed. And they have a nice platform too that makes it, um, it's designed for farmers. And so you don't have to be really techie to get all of your product line online. And that is really nice. Cause of course, I, I mean, that's, that's a concern. 
Yeah. Uh, and that was one of our questions uh, in the Q&A is what web platform do you use and do most vendors use it? It, it, it varies, I would say. Uh, most vendors do use it, um, but I'll, I'll even say it, it varies with the seasons, you know, just um, their, you know, time is the biggest thing. Do they have a little bit of time at the beginning of the week to put their products in? And then do they have time the day before market to, um, it's a really nice system of it. It gets you your, your um, a list of what all your orders were and the customers and you just print it on sticky labels and, and you can fill your bags the day ahead of market of all your orders that have come in. Um, Great. Yeah, and it's, I will say it is easier for um, the baked goods, the canned goods and the meats. Um, they can, you know, list their products and you know essentially it can stay there one week to the next you know their their product line doesn't change a lot um and and so i will say that it, it is an easier system for them than the produce um you know the far the the produce farmers that are um you know their quantities and products may vary more week to week um, yeah. And so that's uh, that obviously a challenge for them as a producer. Now, did you use the um, the grant to go online that was um, some uh, grant toward getting a website and, and going online or, or did you find anything available out there for that? Yes, we, um, we received a sponsorship from Black Hills Energy and then also um, a grant for, for the initial uh, setup costs from uh, Specialty Producers Association. And so that was really helpful to making it doable this year. Um, and then we, we tack on a percentage um, the, the producer puts in the price they want to receive for their product and then we tack on a percentage and that is the price that the customer sees. And so that that little chunk of difference is what we will use to be able to fund the online platform, you know, on a year after year basis. Yes, yeah, so this is something you plan to use for the future that it's um, you invested in something, it sounds like, and that was a question in the Q&A um, that's going to be of use for you for a long time and a, a good technology um, that's going to um, work for you as you grow and do different things and do the wholesale and stuff. So that sounds great. Yeah. Um, it's really had, you know, multiple benefits for, for our market. Um, you know, it, it, it's, um, and just kind of, um, it's been a nice um, kind of modernization, I guess, and, and still retaining, you know, all of the, the, the benefits of a traditional farmer's market. Right. Well, like like we say, going to that innovation, addressing that convenience factor that customers do want and that makes it um, really appealing and easy for them to buy. So as far as vendors, we have a great question here that then does the market process all the payments and then pay the vendors? Um, or do the vendors collect at market or how does that work for vendors to use this? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, so every Saturday, um, at, you know, after our farmers market, once, once all of the, um, the pickup orders, you know, have been, the curbside orders have been picked up, um, it's, it's pretty simple to, um, you know, the, the, I have it set up where the customers enter their credit card information when they place their order. And so, you know, it's, it's a couple of clicks and it processes all of those credit card fees. And so, um, so yeah, everybody's is processed in one swoop. 
and then um, and then each week I uh, just write reimbursement checks to each of the producers. My goal this winter, our next innovation is for me to to automate that system, but one step at a time. Yeah, but it sounds very straightforward to you know that it's it's easy for everyone involved really um, that it's just kind of just making that initial leap and then moving week to week with changing availability and stuff for for those uh, fruit and vegetable producers and things. Yes, right. It really is just you know the biggest thing is that initial. Um, that initial leap um, of, of time to, um, you know, just get it all set up. Yep. Great. Um, some more advantages of this, um, I, I, I just screenshotted kind of the, the back end of the program so that you can kind of get a, a sense of, you know, some of the, the menu items and, and, you know, what's available for you. Um, and so there's there's lots of you know reports that can be generated. Producers can look at you know their sales and and how you know those things are tracking. And then um, you know the market has a little bit of sales data too. And and so that's helpful. We haven't ever had that before. Um, and and can really track um, you know EBT and the wholesale side and those things. Um, you know, really pretty precisely and, and, and generate them, you know, um, in a variety of ways. But the really cool thing was now that, you know, people are going and looking at our online store and they're entering their, their email address um, for us, now we have a contact list of our customers that just this summer is about a thousand, you know, customers long. And so a couple of weeks ago, when we had that snowstorm on a Saturday, I could, you know, send an email directly to our customers and say, you know, the farmer's market's closed today and, and check back with us, um, you know, newsletter generation, those kinds of things, um, I think is really going to be helpful for marketing our, our farmer's market and, and, and updating customers on you know, our hours have changed now that now that it's the winter season, those kinds of things. Yes, great. Well, yeah, and it sounds like there's quite a bit to utilize as a market manager, or um, you could keep it more simple and kind of keep expanding as you go and keep learning about it. And um, but uh, it sounds like it's been really user friendly and um, you have a few considerations before we wrap up here of um, what people should consider if they're um, looking to go online with their market or just with as a producer themselves, it seems, right? Sure. Well, yeah, the biggest thing, you know, is just um, allowing for the time for it. Um, and, and most of the time, you know, was, was at the front end, it was just learning the system. Now that we've been doing it, you know, for a few months, I can really, you know, zip through everything pretty quickly. Um, initially, it took me two weeks to get our store online. Um, and that was fine, but my stress level would have been lower had I had three. <laughs> um, and then, so, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what does it look like on market day, you know, when you have all of these 20 orders coming in. Um, we, the, the producers come and we just have a couple of picnic tables set up at the end of the farmer's market by the manager's booth or the information booth. Um, and, and I picked up a bunch of totes off of Uline that are stackable and, and reusable. And so I just set out one box um, or, or whoever's, you know, doing the distribution sets out one box, you know, per order. And then um, the system lets me just print off all the customer names. I, I, I have a list of the name, the phone number and the number of items. And so I just clip that to each box 
And then when the producers come with their items, um, you know, it's pretty easy. Oh, this bag of beets goes in, um, you know, Jennifer Jones's box. And so all the producers can, can bring their stuff together and it makes it just really easy to find it for both the producer and the customer. And also to know if there's anything missing, you know, you can count up the items pretty easily. Um, and then anything, the meats, the eggs, anything that needs refrigeration, um, we, we have a cooler or two next to it. And then, um, so those items would go in the cooler and then the producer would just put, you know, a fluorescent um, index card in that box and that just flags it for uh, somebody, oh, there's more items than it, what is in this box and they can go looking for them. So that, that um, you know, makes it pretty uh, slick and, and reduces the number of, of order errors that we might have. Great. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. I hope we get to continue this and maybe do um, like a little uh, training or anything, something like that maybe with you for people who are maybe a little intimidated or not sure about, you know, just the workload of, of transitioning to online. And, um, you know, we're gonna see, we'll see from our members of Specialty Producers Association if that's something, uh, an educational component that they're interested in. And I, I, I have a feeling people are interested in either upgrading or, um, or just getting online to begin with. So such great information and, and it sounds like a great success. And we um, really appreciate your time. I know we went a little bit long, so thank you for being here and, and everyone for um, sticking it out here with us. I think we are going to take a little bit of a break before we get to the um, chef's presentation and that will be um, Chef Scott Brinker of Monument Health and he will be on um, we can take about a you know about a 10 to 15 minute break about a 10 minute break here that he is uh, scheduled to start 725 um, just so that if people were planning on that, <laughs> um, that they can be back here 725 and um, we'll get to watch him. He's got an amazing meal and he and Cindy are going to be out at Monument Hospital Rapid City doing that next. There is a panel poll that um, you can give us some feedback here. And we are going to be um, emailing a more lengthy survey too, so you can give us even more feedback. But I'll um, leave this to uh, the break and you don't have to log off or anything. You can just um, stay logged in or you can log off and log back in and we will um, see you at 725.